Okay, we're recording. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Humphreys. This is Reaffilia Freshwater uh, Interviews in Freshwater Science, and today I'm very happy to have somebody to interview who I've known for a long time, on and off. Um, Long-time professor of ecology at University of Melbourne, but now an honorary prof professorial fellow, I gather, Barb, um, Barb Downs. And I'll just, as a preamble, welcome, Barb. Um, as a preamble, I, I, I started, I, I should actually do this at the beginning of all these interviews because I do know most of the people I talk to and it's sort of like saying a conflict of interest. I remember, because I was part of the CRC for Freshwater, Eco Freshwater Ecology, employed by Monash University. I think my first encounter with you, Barb, was probably in 1995 when I started there. I came from Tasmania after doing my, I did my PhD and then I went to Tassie for a little while and came to, um, up to Walbury, but, but employed through Monash and so through Sam Lake. And you were at Monash at that time. And I remember this, if you excuse the, the, the um, plaudits, I remember this, barrel of energy intellectual energy that that sort of semi scared me at least because you were you were everybody everybody said how how dynamic and clever you were and i must admit that i was a little bit intimidated at the time because you you had this energy intellectual energy as well as physical energy um from be beetling around the monash but um, I soon came to realize that you obviously you were a very nice person at the same time um, and it had great conversations with you and, and, and involved with various aspects of, of the CRC. Um, and we've caught up sort of periodically over the last 20 plus years or so. So it's really nice to finally catch up. <laughs> so welcome. Um, um, like with a lot of these interviews, I'm really interested in to, to hear about Sort of the beginnings of of your interest in science and how you got into in freshwater ecology more generally so can i ask you a little bit about your background you were born in adelaide is that right that's correct yeah yeah um so, and born in adelaide. yep and so tell us a little bit about your background your parents and and what inspired you to get into science in the first place well um so uh my parents are both uh were they both passed now uh both english mm -hmm. and um uh, both from solidly working class backgrounds um you know my mum uh, grew up in a quite poor but respectable working class household in manchester mm -hmm. uh, my dad was in a um, extremely poor situation uh, raised mostly by his mother and sister in london mm -hmm. and um they met uh, after the war, after World War II, and at that point, uh, my dad had wangled his way into a engine engineering position without any engineering qualifications, and they got an opportunity to migrate to Australia. And you know, I think they looked at England and saw that poor people in England tend to stay in the lower ranks. Um, and that they saw that as a huge opportunity to make a big difference to their own lives and, and the lives of their kids. So they migrated to Australia. And, uh, and so in terms of um, uh, their support, they were incredibly supportive. And I think the reason behind this is, of course, neither of them ever got an opportunity to go on for higher education. Um, for my mum, of course, mm. born in 1929, the idea of girls going to university was still kind of like, what? No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I don't think she even finished high school. Uh, and for my dad, uh, he had an opportunity to go to tertiary uh, education, but it got squashed um, by, his, by his mother and sister. Mm -hmm. So for them, education was paramount. They saw that as the way out of poverty for them because my dad was very much self-made in, in some ways even though he hadn't been able to go on to university he was incredibly skilled and my mum just was in her own way really a feminist although she would never have used that word but the thing she really inculcated in me and my sister was 
Be independent. Mm -hmm. Don't be reliant on others. Don't get hooked up in relationships where you have no control over your own finances. Be independent. Um, and so was my dad. Um, I think having been raised by his mother, mostly, his father was really out of the picture. He really had a sympathetic view to the role of women in society uh, and or the roles that are imposed on women, let me put it that way, mm -hmm. and saw that a lot of that was very unfair. Mm -hmm. So a big supporter as well. Great. Um, so why science? Why science, to, though? To, why science? Well, when I was about, um, I think when I was about 11, I suddenly developed a fascination with birds mm -hmm. and started to do a lot of bird watching. And it didn't go away. So my parents decided it was not just a sort of passing fad and started buying me bird books and binoculars and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I just became obsessed with, with looking at birds and learning all their calls and being able to identify them. And that morphed into me for a clarity around by about 12, mm. I already knew what I wanted to do. Mm. I didn't know the name of it, <laughs> but I wanted to be out in nature and I wanted to be studying animals. Mm. Mm. Um, and so uh, in high school, uh, when I was about 15, I wrote to the zoology department at Adelaide Uni. It wasn't addressed to anybody because I didn't know anyone. Uh, I just wrote to the zoology department, said I really wanted, this is the kind of job I want to do. I don't know what it's called. Can you advise me about what subjects I should take in the final two years of high school? And I got a response, wow. um, which is very nice. Mm. Somebody in this department got this letter said, great, and wrote back and provided me with the relevant advice. Um, so from there, I went on to the University of Adelaide and did a Bachelor of Science so can I, I just ask you, I wrote. can I ask you, so at high school you did biology? Yes. Because um, I know that a lot of people I've talked to, biology wasn't something that necessarily they did at high school, but they took picked up at, 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 at university level. Because I think physics and chemistry, at least in my experience too, were, were, were fairly standard sort of things. But the biology was a bit iffy often at high school, but at, at, but at university it was much more substantial. Yeah. 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 Um... Well, that was the advice that I was given yeah. by yeah. Shelley Barker, who was the academic who wrote back to me saying, you don't have to do biology um, in the final year of high school, but I really recommend it. Mm. So I did biology. I think I did chemistry. Uh, I can't honestly remember all my subjects. English would have been in there because that was a requirement. I think I dropped physics mm -hmm. and did chemistry because that was also recommended. And I also did recently not the highest level maths because that was not my forte but mm. some maths mm. um so and that did stand me in good stead because i loved it i just aced everything in the biology subject i did all sorts of extracurricular things uh that i didn't have to do uh like i you know I grew drosophila and did some <laughs> crossing experiments and things like that at high school <laughs> um yeah so then um i went on to a bsc at the university of adelaide Mm -hmm. And I uh, met Shelley Parker, who remembered me, oh, really? kept the letter and was waiting for me to turn up. And so I was really quite chuffed when I did finally turn up as a first year student. And so, so, yes, that, um, you, did, so you did undergraduate. Um, and, you know, I, I, we were talking about this the other day and I had no knowledge about what honours was really or what research was. But did somebody did somebody encourage you to do to do honours as the fourth year or did you have a, a perception that you wanted to do that? Oh, that was already part of the plan. Okay. So I had done enough research to know that if I wanted to go on and become a research ecologist, having finally got the name of what yeah. I wanted to be, mm -hmm. that I would have to do an honours degree as a minimum and then probably a PhD as well mm -hmm. um, if I wanted to do a full research career. So that was already part of the plan. Mm -hmm. um, honours was, for me, um, not quite how I expected because... I wanted desperately to work with the marine ecologist on staff, Alan Butler. And I actually got trained up as a diver so that I could do subtitle research. Um, but Alan turned me down. He already had said yes to two mm. other people and he told me, no, sorry. Mm. And I was quite bereft because I, I hadn't really looked at anybody else in the department. And the only person left was the departmental parasitologist, Slim Somerville. Right. And his was the only zoology subject 
I hadn't done. <laughs> I'd done everybody else's. I filled out third year with as much zoology as I was allowed to. Hadn't done his subject. So I was really quite crestfallen about this and disheartened. But um, I somehow heard about a guy called Mike Bull. So you were just telling me about how um, you were let down by the person you wanted to do honours with and the only person really left was the course of the subject you hadn't done. That's right. <laughs> Departmental parasitologist. Parasites were one thing, I kind of like, mm, not sure about that. <laughs> so, um, but I was desperate to do honours and so he agreed to take me on, but he said, well, you'll need to, you'll need to find a project. Mm -hmm. And somehow I learned about uh, a guy called Mike Bull, who almost everybody in Australian college knows Mike. Mm -hmm. um, because he was doing research on ticks that parasitize reptiles. And there was a suggestion that maybe he might um, uh, be able to supply some, some ticks that I could work with and, and ask some basic questions about how ticks find lizards. Mm -hmm. So that's what I ended up doing my honors on. Um, and like all projects, once you start and it becomes your own, it becomes exactly. interesting. Yes, exactly. And, and so I got fascinated by this whole question of, how do ticks find lizards? Mm -hmm. And that's what I spent my honours year finding out. Uh, and unbeknownst to me then, um, that project actually set me on course for questions that I would ask later on that I would never have thought of mm -hmm. because it morphed into a fascination with animals that have to find small units of really patchy habitat. Now, parasites are kind of like an extreme example of that. But there's many other species as well. Where, okay, so this is making sense now. Yeah, so they're, <laughs> they're looking for very specific places. So um, so I completed my honours. Mm -hmm. um, I mostly enjoyed the experience. As we all know, honours is a white knuckle ride down to the end, and it's pretty hard. Um, and I did okay. I didn't get a first. So I got a 2A, but um, it's probably fair to say that a 2A was actually considered a good mark in 1981. Yes, yes, and I yes. Did it. Yep, yep. Um, so that was all fine. Um, so from there, uh, I guess we move on to, to, to what happened next. Yeah, how, did you, how does a, a, a young honours, newly graduate honours student from Adelaide get to Florida? <laughs> how does that happen? Well, um, I got an opportunity to... Uh, go to California mm -hmm. and uh, to do some research there. And the, uh, the mechanism by which I got there is not really germane to the story um, mm -hmm. okay. at all. So it was an opportunity and I took that opportunity and I lived uh, in California for about a year and a half mm -hmm. and was doing subtitled marine research. So I finally got to do some diving and some diving. And where, whereabouts in California was that? So I was based at UCSB, uh, at University of California, Santa Barbara. Wow, and we were fantastic. doing research on Santa Catalina Island, one of the big channel, California Channel Islands. Yep, yep. Uh, which is obviously a gorgeous yeah. place to work. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> really a privilege, um, you know, although we had to get up at some god-awful hour in the morning to drive to LA to get the ferry. So you'd have to get up at 4.30. And I always remember by the time we got to LA, getting on the ferry, ferry I'd just be wrecked and, you know, want to go downstairs, but then get seasick. <laughs> is, that the, is that the spot where it's famous for flying fish? Or am I, I thinking somewhere else? I know about flying fish. Okay. Um, I thought you were about to say, is that the place that's famous because Natalie Wood died there? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, yeah, that's where... No, 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 no. I've, I've, I've never seen a flying fish and I really want to and I've just been looking up sort of the places to go and there's somewhere off the Californian coast that around there that there's flying fish well known. can't remember no. actually okay. hearing about that or seeing any. Good opportunity to see whales though. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so that was, um, that was great uh, and I got a couple of publications out of this and, and I also published my honours work while this is going on as yeah, well so nice. that that's been published and then from there i got an opportunity to do my postgraduate work at florida state university mm -hmm. uh, again the hows and whys of that um doesn't really matter mm -hmm. um, it was an opportunity which i took and uh, florida state university so now we're talking in the the mid 1980s mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 
Florida State University at that time had uh, a group of academics in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology who were radically changing ecology. Mm. They were being mm. extremely critical of what they saw as poor quality science, illogical, badly thought science. And uh, they were nicknamed the FSU Mafia because <laughs> basically they no holds barred uh, talks and uh, no holds barred publications in which people found their work being torn apart. So, of course, that created a lot of um, mm -hmm. animosity which, as well. Can I ask the names of these people? Oh, you absolutely can. Um, Dan Simbloff is, mm -hmm. would have been the lead of that, Don mm -hmm. Strong mm -hmm. and Larry Abel. Uh, mm -hmm. The three okay. of those were all part of this, this group. And really what they were doing, and particularly Dan, was pushing the idea that you have to have clarity around your hypothesis. You have to be, have clarity around a null hypothesis because, of course, Bayesian wasn't on the scene then, so that really was the, the main way of doing things. And that it's not okay to just describe patterns and then fit your favourite model to those patterns without considering alternative explanations. Mm -hmm. And one of the major victims, of course, was Jared Diamond, uh, most people now know him as this guy who keeps kind of publishing books on all sorts of topics. And he was actually not an ecologist by training, but, but dabbled and went to Papua New Guinea and the various islands and collected data on birds and then mm. published all of these papers about mm -hmm. how birds came on islands. And <laughs> he attracted a, a lot of a criticism because his work didn't feature this idea that we should think about alternative explanations for patterns. We mustn't get wedded to one view of the world and then desperately look for patterns. Confirmation we... bias. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So that was all going on in the 1980s. People were dead scared to give a seminar <laughs> at FSU because these people would be in the audience. And and as a student, of course, it was a, it was a massive privilege mm. to, to do my postgraduate work at that time and be part of that and see all that unfolding. Um, but it was also massively intimidating oh, because yes, here yes. are people, uh, you know, Simbolov's name I think is known broadly outside of, of, of ecology even because of his uh, impact on the field. Mm -hmm. So it was hugely intimidating. The expectations on postgrads were of course sky high. And how did you how did you feel about that? I mean, were you feeling confident about that or? Yeah, it was that sort of thing that um, I, I, I only sort of learned all the all this after going mm -hmm. um, and being there and then suddenly recognising the role that this department was playing in a, sort of a revolution in ecology that was really challenging uh, ecologists to up their game and do much better science. And presumably quite a lot of their postgraduate students that graduated from that, including yourself, spread out from there and and influence the next generation of ecology, I suppose. Yeah, I think I think so. Um, like 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 most fights in ecology, it it went on for too long, mm. <laughs> um, and it kind of reminds me of sort of old bulls getting to sort of lock <laughs> horns when all the junior crowd have gone, eh, boring. See, so <laughs> the younger generation were already like, yes, of course, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was a it was pretty exciting. Um, intimidating <laughs> and um and i had to come up with a project so my supervisor was don strong one of the one of the three he agreed mm -hmm. to take me on and uh i again still had this fascination with animals living in very patchy environments and i can't remember what uh got me on the track but i ended up working on freshwater mussels mm -hmm. which have these little mites um, gen the genus is well, the Uniacolidae, I think is the is the name, um, and there's heaps of them, many mm. many species, mm. and they live part of their life inside the muscle. The female lays her eggs in the gills. Um, those hatch, and then the you know the larvae are basically blown out the exhale and siphon. Um, so, what if, what if, so the adults eat some. What, so the adult it's a parasitic situation here. So yeah, more, what do they? Less. Do they get the they get food from the the gills off the gills of the mussels? How does yes, that work? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Probably they're also taking some food as well as using the the gills as a place to lay their eggs, which of mm -hmm. course is very safe. Mm -hmm. And they can go in and out through the through the siphons of the, right. <laughs> the mussel. Yeah. Um, 
And so a, basically a perfect system to ask questions about because there were multiple species of mussels. They had different species of mites. Uh, some of them seemed to be territorial. So you could only ever get two of certain <laughs> species and one would be on one pet of gills and the other on the other pet. Um, so really mm, just what I needed to work on. Mm -hmm. um, so the difficulty, uh, so I had a fairly uh, disastrous PhD in, uh, in some ways, although it all came good in the end. But after I've been going for about um, a couple of years on this, on this project, I had various long-term data collection going on. So uh, stuff where I was basically measuring recruitment by taking mussels that were empty of mites mm -hmm. and planting them out in the field in cages and then collecting them seeing what mites were in them and then putting them back out again. So I was effectively doing recruitment studies in the way that marine ecologists were putting out settlement tiles and seeing what, what ended up on them. Yep, yep. But that's the sort of data where I had to do it for quite a while to, to get anything out of it. Um, and unbeknownst to me, you know, Don, my supervisor, was n not happy uh, with things and not happy with my progress. And... Um, simply told me one day that he was um, not going to be my supervisor anymore Jeez. and I was dumped um, with no notice, no opportunity to, to uh, understand any of this or why it was. I have to that, say that, 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 that oh, interesting enough, um, I've just been reading something recently, that, that's a huge thing for a PhD student or a it, master's student. Well, that's about as massive as it gets. That's you know? right, yeah. Um, and, you know, I was very, uh, immature i would say in those days for for my age i mean i uh sure i'd moved out of home but i didn't have a lot of experience mm. and um uh also lacked a lot of confidence and i think it was one of those things that don looked at my lack of confidence and saw instead a lack of talent mm. and um mm. and so that i think was at the back of it he had no confidence in my ability to run this project he didn't understand anything about muscles or mites. He didn't work on them. Um, and so he felt, you know, that I should stop doing that project. And he said, well, if you do another project, then you can work on something that I work on, then you can continue with me. But I'd already invested two years in what I was mm. doing. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty devastated. I, I have to say the only thing that kept me going through that was my fellow postgrads. We had a really tight group. Um, they were we were all very supportive of each other. I was not the only person that Don Strong had done this to. He had dumped a whole series of people before me, um, probably for the same kinds of reasons of general unhappiness. But back in those days, um, and, and in, especially in the US, you had committees, didn't you? Who were, yes. And do they not have a say in in the process? In the, no, the committees were, yes, you sort of met, mm. um, but they didn't have that kind of oversight role. I mean, right. really, you had a supervisor and you you worked with that supervisor. Yeah. And the committee kind of was just there at the points of, um, we didn't have confirmation, but we did have things like oral exams. They were part of that. And of course, at the end, when you yeah. had to do an oral defense. Yes. But other than that, no, they weren't okay. hugely involved. And, and, and in back in those days too, it wasn't so common to have multiple supervisors. No, no. no it was very uncommon actually. Yeah, Most yeah. had a supervisor and that was it. Yep. Anyway, so, um, so one of my uh, colleagues, my uh, fellow PhD students, uh, a woman called Sharon Strauss, who was uh, being supervised by Dan and mm. quite interestingly she had been started off with someone else and had a falling out and had moved to FSU to work with Dan mm -hmm. so she was incredibly sympathetic to the situation and she urged me to go talk to Dan about becoming my supervisor um, so I did that and I could tell he was reluctant but I also think there was some level of responsibility here because because Don had done this a number of times before, and this is the sort of thing whereby you know, the department has to start asking questions about sure, how come yeah. you're kind of cutting all of these PhD students adrift you know, midway. Mm -hmm. You should be making that decision in the first six months. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, Dan took me on, and that was very intimidating because, A, because he's a very smart guy, and absolutely everyone knew that, but also because he was really hard to get to know. So I 
never even had a conversation with him before. Mm. And, you know, he would do things like, you know, look to the side when you pass him in the corridor to avoid making eye contact, which, of course, that's very off-putting. You sort of think, oh, this person really doesn't, doesn't want to interact with me at all. Um, and I, I later discovered the reason was he was just incredibly shy to the point of a, almost a pathology that mm. he couldn't be in a room with more than one or two people he didn't know without feeling like he had to leave that room. And so he's indeed very hard to get to know. I know how he feels sometimes with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. I've come to the conclusion some years ago that I'm not sure about other types of science, but I think in our field, looking at the, down the corridor in my own building, I can sort of count the number of extroverts on the, the fingers, on one finger and, and the rest are, <laughs> are introverts. Yeah. Really? <laughs> and I, I don't know, it's not quite the same as being shy, but it, it, there's, some, there's some overlap there anyway. Yeah, I, well, I'm calling it shyness. I think there's something a lot more to it than, than sure, that. Sure, sure. Um, but he agreed to take me on. And, but the other thing that happened was, um, you know, there was a sort of departmental meeting about this. And I was busted down to a master's because, you know, the view I think had been put very strongly by Don that I was not up to snuff, that I wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, I didn't have enough talent or drive or whatever it was. Mm. And there was collective agreement about this. And so I was busted down to a master's. So uh, I was told that news as well. Wow. And uh, so I then... Can I, saw... can I ask you, can I ask Bob, did you ever have... I mean, it sounds like, and I can't imagine you didn't, and I've been through something similar a, a couple of times, is you had, I mean, these must have been real blows to your confidence. Did you ever have the, did you ever think this is just too hard? I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll go and do something else? No. Wow. No, no not, not at all. I was absolutely committed to, to what I was doing. And yep. I, I absolutely wanted to finish the PhD. So, uh, no, never thought about that for a moment. Wow. Um, just try to kind of figure out how am I going to make this happen. Mm. So uh, I had to come up with a master's project. So I dreamed up some experiments that I hadn't planned on doing that I thought that can be a coherent set of experiments I could run up for a master's. And meanwhile, I kept all the PhD stuff that I was doing going as well. Um, and so uh, That's the first time I've ever heard of a person doing essentially two masters and PhD at the same time. Well, that's impressed. right, and of course, you know, the department wasn't really aware of that particularly, mm -hmm. and they were sort of ignoring it. But uh, that's what I ended up doing. So I finished those experiments, and I wrote up the masters, uh, defended that, and um, then went to talk to Dan and said, "Right, well, I want to now resume my PhD, and would you please be my supervisor?" And he was kind of like, well, no, I, I don't think so. I can't remember the words he used. And I completely lost my temper and <laughs> just unloaded on him. Wow. This was completely unfair. Mm. I had done everything had been asked of me. And he backed down immediately. And uh, I never heard word one about it ever again. <laughs> uh, and he was a, a good supervisor in the sense that he was uh, critical. He provided critical input, but there's a reason why all of my PhD and master's publications are solo, because largely all of that work was done entirely by myself. It mm. was designed by myself. All of it was done by myself. So, I mean, I sort of regret not publishing with Dan, but the, the reality was that he hadn't contributed and I think he would have refused even if I had offered. Yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it, that one? I've, I've Again, I've experienced something similar and it's you know, you probably would have been nice to publish with him, but at the time it didn't make sense because you no. were you were independent. You did this work yourself. Yeah, it's, it didn't even occur to me. I think that's the the interesting thing because I had so invested of myself in this sure. and, and fought so much adversity to to get all of that done. Mm. Um, so I picked up my PhD, and um, so I was at FSU for five years, and. Um, and so I'm on the record as having done a master's that took three and a half years and a PhD in 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> Must be the fastest PhD in history. <laughs> it's sort of, it's quite farcical at, at some level. Um, and 
it was it was a hard time, but mm. I have to say that I grew up immensely during that time. Um, and because things that are hard, if you get through them, they make you more confident to deal with things like that. And yeah, it was and, difficult, but I, I learned. And um, again, you know, sort of um, from my own experience too, that getting examiner's comments back from when you've when you've had had your ability questioned at times and then getting examiner's comments back which i presume were fairly um fairly good i i i don't know um but getting those examiner's comments back to to validate what you've done and say it was good to me at least for that was a great thing to, to do because i'd been questioning aspects of my own stuff through various degrees but do it, getting that, I thought, yeah, okay, I can do this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they have oral exams, so we don't have the um, the thesis just go out for examination. No, no. So you do a defence. Yes. So that's what I mean is an oral defence. Yep. And they will bring in an external examiner uh, and your committee form other parts of mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. examination committee, if you like. Um, and so they've read the thesis, obviously, and then you do a presentation and then they grill you and ask difficult questions. And if you successfully defend, then then that's it. You're done. And do you, um, I have heard from a, um, a colleague of mine who I think was at Kansas, that at some stage, I think during their PhDs, I think, I, I think I've got this right, is that they sort of do an oral examination where they can ask you almost anything. Yes. That's did right. You, did so you have that too? Yes, that's in the first. Yes, I actually did that in the first, the first year I was at FSU. I had to go through wow. and pass oral exams. Um, they were just written questions, but they were dreamed, and you could sort of consult books. Hmm. But they were the kinds of questions whereby it wasn't just rote answer. You had to think and come up with a, a sensible explanation yeah. for it. So I'd already passed my oral right. exam, okay. PhD early early on. So hmm. Hmm. and so you finish your PhD. And how did you end up back in Australia and this time at, at Monash? Well, um, so I finished my PhD. Uh, there's just one other story. I might oh, yeah. Like no, to, go for it. To add before I move on. Yeah, sure. So um, I still remember the day of oral defence because I think Dan had really changed his mind. Um, I had demonstrated to him that I, I actually did have good competency mm -hmm. and, um, and I, I think he was genuinely thrilled that I finished and so I think I felt I joined the ranks of his students not somebody he took on reluctantly but somebody he was quite proud in the end to have mm, and um, I had come back to Australia uh, shortly before I uh, finished and um, had gone to Melbourne mm. and specifically to go and see Sam Lake mm. because I was thinking ahead well, I'm going to go home back to Australia who would be really good to work with and so I called up Sam out of the blue. He didn't know me from a bar of soap, explained my situation and said, could I come out and have a chat with him about possible postdocs? Mm -hmm. And he was very amenable to that. So I went out and, and chatted with him. And um, I guess we struck it off reasonably well um, because he uh, later on got a centre, uh, Centre for Stream Ecology with Barry Hart. Mm -hmm. And he had a postdoc, mm -hmm. which he then invited me to apply for. But um, meanwhile, uh, after I'd finished my PhD, um, there's a, a wonderful story I want to tell about Dan, which kind of goes back to what I was saying. That I think in the end, he was really quite proud of the how I'd overcome this adversity and, and actually finished and proved all of them wrong, mm -hmm. um, that had decided that I was not good enough to do a PhD. Uh, which is that when it became clear I had this job and I, because I won the postdoc, obviously, with Sam. Um, obviously, I wouldn't be telling the story if I didn't want it. Um, <laughs> uh, he threw a party for me. And this is unheard of. Wow. Um, absolutely unheard of for Dan to invite um, all the postgrads and staff to his home to have a barbecue as a, as a send-off. And uh, for a guy who, you know, has a hard time tolerating people he doesn't know. That was a that was an, a wonderful gesture, really, oh, really wonderful gesture. That's a lovely story. It is a lovely oh. story. It also has a funny little twist to it. Now, one of the 
very interesting things about Dan that almost nobody knows is that uh, he steals, or used to, <laughs> before they changed it, he stole cutlery off airlines. <laughs> right. Now, this is in the day where you got proper cutlery, right? Mm -hmm. And the cutlery would often be stamped with the insignia of the airline. Yep. Now, he was doing this because he was in a competition with another ecologist called Paul Dayton, who's a mm -hmm. quite famous marine ecologist yes. in California. Yep. And they got into this massive competition <laughs> over who could get more airline cutlery off the most airlines, both domestic <laughs> and international. And um, so Dan was uh, actually uh, sitting next to some guy who writes uh, Wheels magazine on one of his his jaunts on an airplane and the guy noticed him secreting cutlery into his bag and said, what are you doing? So Dan explained all this and the guy was so taken with this incredible story about these two academics <laughs> stealing airline cutlery in, a, in some sort of weird competition uh, that he wrote a story about it in Will's magazine. <laughs> it was bizarre. But at the party, uh, Dan had brought out all of his stolen airline cutlery to serve the guests <laughs> and it was all there and uh, i remember suggesting maybe we should steal some of it but that down went down very badly <laughs> oh look i um just fortunately it'll only be a trip between you and me this story so nobody else will hear about that so that's okay <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful that's that's lovely so yeah. um so you left florida after that and so, um, um how, can, how, can i ask how you heard of sam lake at that um by that time because sam hadn't been at monash that long had he i Probably. can't remember when he joined monash um maybe maybe he had been, been a five been, or six been years. there for a little while i didn't cloud okay we are recording again so on you go <laughs> so I, uh, I i didn't actually know sam at all um but i wanted to go back to australia i had looked at different universities for anybody maybe working on freshwater systems because I decided I really quite like rivers, although I've worked on some very peculiar animals. I, I liked working in them as a system. Um, and so I saw Sam Lake's name there and I looked at a few of his papers and I thought this could be very, very interesting. Although he's doing stuff really quite different from what I was doing, I thought, well, this really could, could work. Mm -hmm. So basically uh, I took it from there actually. So having, um, been awarded the research fellowship, um, left the US, I'd been there seven years, so that was quite a wrench, um, mm -hmm. and uh, leaving behind some really, really intense friendships with, with people, and yet this happens, of course, we all we all move on. And uh, moved to Melbourne and started my postdoc there with Sam. And I had a lot of uh, literature I had to read because I didn't read the stream literature as such. I was working on parasites and I was reading the marine literature for inspiration and nothing about uh, streams particularly and nothing about stream invertebrates. I had never learned to identify any of them. Mm. So I had quite a steep learning curve um, to, uh, to overcome to start working with Sam. Can I ask you too how how the difference between working with somebody like Dan Simbaloff and and Sam Lake? Uh, <laughs> that's, oh wow, that's chalk talking cheese. Dan, as I said, very hands off. Mm. Like um, you know, I had to initiate meetings and he would uh, read drafts, but basically everything else I did myself. And um, I think he was most he was like that with most of his students. He he really expected you to be independent and just get on with it and he was not there to baby you mm -hmm. um at all um sam uh, very different he's very likes to interact you know uh, a lot of the time i was there i would remember he would just get bored with something he was doing in his office and he'd come in and tromp around the lab and make a racket for five minutes and say silly things and then go back and <laughs> again. yes i remember so, that <laughs> yeah he like did like and but that's that was really nice because it also felt he was very much involved in what was going on he also came out in the field always as well um so it really was a good professional relationship i think we learned a lot from each from each other mm -hmm. um and of course you know, anybody who knows sam knows he has an incredibly encyclopedic knowledge of literature um can recall papers he read 30 years ago mm -hmm. without any difficulty 
and also an encyclopedic knowledge about other things because he reads enormously, you know, likes to go plays. Um, yeah. And, and so he's just this kind of person who has this immense fount of knowledge. Um, and it's really, really quite admirable. Because he, he was a reader for quite a long time at Monash, wasn't he? And, and I, I, I don't remember who told me what a reader was. But <laughs> prior, to uni, uh, prior to computers, um, readers were expected to go into the library and sit there sort of fairly for long periods of time to, to read very generally, I think, in the area, didn't they? So they could then talk to other people about everything. And Sam yeah, was it, Sam was it, ideal for that. Yes, exactly. It, it's um, it was a position that was above senior lecturer, mm. but not quite to professor. But the word reader was designed was designed to mean this is someone who is broad, who reads a lot, has broad international knowledge. I mean, having applied for being reader myself before that that was position was abandoned, and it's mm. now called you know, a, um, associate professor, of course. Um, it was all about the difference between just an associate professor and a reader is a reader has a strong international reputation as a scholar mm, in their field, mm, mm. which I think is a really nice differentiation, which yeah. has been sort of lost. Yeah, I, I like I like the concept of a reader. I like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, Sam was a very different kettle of fish. Oh, hugely. Yeah, um, and you know, wonderful to work with. What a fantastic sense of humour uh, that he had. He was always coming in, um, talking about how you know Marilyn, his wife, who is uh, of course a very well-renowned academic in her own right, in mm. a historian uh, and women's studies, uh, about how Marilyn was making his life so difficult because <laughs> it was his turn to cook dinner or do something like this. And he'd always do, use these very aggrieved tones, uh, which was all put on and the tea room would just dissolve into laughter because everybody thought, well, that's just silly. <laughs> yeah, you're being silly, Sam. We know that he absolutely supports doing equal shares. So, I mean, that was really wonderful to, to, to work with Sam. It's not that he was absolutely perfect. He, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think he had a lot of male students and by the time I arrived, he was surrounded by women. Mm. <laughs> he had mostly women PhD students. He had a female postdoc. And he suddenly found that the dynamic was a, a wee bit different uh, and uh, that we would call him up on things if he was a bit sexist with language or something like that. But he always took it in very good spirit. And mm. he didn't ever repeat it when he was actually pointed out to him, actually, that's a bit sexist, Sam. He would, oh, okay. And that would be the end of it. Uh, when, I, when I did honours in there in, in 1983 with Sam, so this is prior to this, um, and Sabina Schreiber and Rod St. Clair were, were there doing masters, I think, PhDs later on, mm -hmm. and Leon Barmuda and, and Andrew Bolton. Um, and I found it a very, I mean, there was such a great community of, yeah. uh, of people. And as you say, sort of Sam was this <laughs> gadfly sort of buzzing around, throwing sort of bombs in it occasionally. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and some of them went off um, well, and some of them um, just were, were fizzes and things. Yeah. But I think it was um, it was a great great environment, which I, I still sort of um, think about with great with fondness to this yes, day. I do too. And, yeah. and ideas, you know, he yeah. would read huge amounts, and he would come you know, brimming with ideas and excitement about possibilities, um, and be interested in talking about, could we do this as a, you know, an experiment in streams and things like that. So, you know, he's very much pushing boundaries in his own way. But he was supportive of your, your, you, your independence and also your wanting to go in particular directions. Yeah, very much so. Um, you know, I got, um, so I was a, a postdoc with him at the Centre for Stream Ecology, I think for a, a year or two. Mm -hmm. And then I applied for an ARC postdoctoral fellowship which I, I was awarded so I then I went on to my own pot of money but I was still his postdoc and we were still working together um, and we did some uh, research which I think I, I look back on and sort of say at the time I thought this is the best research I had ever done because we were so well resourced um, with we got a grant at the same time as I got this postdoc to do this work and we were really well resourced with people and time to do it um, and uh, that research was very much around this fascination that I had also developed at this time about 
wondering why there are so many species that are able to live together. Mm. So one of the things I got coming to Monash and suddenly kind of being a stream person and I'm looking at stream fauna, mostly invertebrates, of course, was just thinking about the incredible diversity of life. I mean, there's just so many species mm. and they're all living together. And how is this possible? Um, and so that work that we did, uh, that I did then for that um, postdoc was all around asking questions about habitat structure. So complex environments can get more species than simple environments, but also what's the cause and effect mechanism that can actually drive that. And we were doing all of these experiments. I actually, I find it quite funny these, these days because you'd never do this kind of work now because the field has so moved on. But, you know, the whole experiment and three years of work in one riffle in one river, mm -hmm. because we were working on individual rocks as our unit of replication. We were trying to figure out how many species can live together on one rock. Uh, can I ask you how did you see parallels at that stage between because you had that marine, uh, you had some marine experience. Did you have mm -hmm. that? Did you did you read the marine literature and, and look at that to the intertidal area and and, and um, uh, and and think about how that might relate to what you were doing in the in freshwater at that stage. Yeah, I, I I did, and I think one of the things that I have thought about um, in latter years is I have worked on a lot of different kinds of ecosystems and types mm. of species. You mm. know, so ticks on lizards and mites and mussels. I've worked on limpets in the intertidal zone. I've worked on uh, Cecil species like bryozoans and sponges subtitly and looked at fish predation. Mm. Um, I did a little bit of work in uh, freshwater marshes that was actually with Don uh, on his project. So looking at uh, animals living in that kind of environment. And I think that breadth of working in different ecosystems is really good for you because the literature is hugely canalized. Um, you know, people don't read outside of the kind of papers mm. that, that mm. you know re, you know relate to the kind of ecosystem they're working on. At least they they don't unless they're theoreticians. Um, and so there's enormous uh, separation amongst various groups that all call themselves ecologists, but the marine people are working on marine things and they're publishing in marine journals and occasionally putting something in a general journal. Same for freshwater people. Same for terrestrial people. Same for mammals, fish. You know, there's tribes and we all kind of uh, publish in different places and if you do that your entire life there's a good chance you don't realize that your kind of horizons have shrunk yes. to a really quite small set of questions and ideas mm -hmm. rather than standing back from it and the other thing too is I've never forgotten that the, one of the goals of ecology as a discipline is to overcome those seeming differences between ecosystems and discover patterns and processes mm, mm. that are true across those kinds of divisions and you know i must say my time at um santa barbara uh, you know this was also an incredible wonderful place to be mm, mm. not least because that's where joseph connell was mm. yeah um, and joe connell is one of the people i think i find him hugely inspirational because he was so unassuming he was a really lovely person, very easy to talk to. If he was at a conference, he would ignore all the established academics and simply go talk to all the students. He'd just walk up and say, hi, I'm Joe. Tell me about your research. And he's just so warm that people had no, didn't find him difficult to deal with at all. And he was pursuing questions that were, tr that were bigger than the animals or plants that he mm. was actually working on. He mm. obviously mostly worked on animals, of course. And he was doing that. He was discovering um, uh, patterns and processes that were not intrinsic to the organisms he was working on. Now, most people heard of Joe Connell. He published a definitive paper on the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. And that, of course, was taken up by so many different people. Mm, mm, mm. And uh, I've, I've always felt that the, that is the kind of ecologist I want to be, an empiricist. Get your evidence, but, but don't turn into a bug person or don't turn into a marine person use like, them as a vehicle for understanding those bigger things that, that's exactly right yeah that's exactly i agree right. look i agree and I, I mean i've been hugely influenced by marine the marine work and um, taking into freshwater for fish um, fish recruitments mm. on the side of things and um it, it to, to, to just 
live in that silo um, of in your particular area is 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 very limiting. But yeah, I like I like that. I like that. Yeah, we do want ideally a good ecologist will will want their to have those uh, th come to those bigger conclusions more generally. I think yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think the job, and I take this quite seriously, actually, as, a, as an academic who's been paid out of the public purse um, for many, many years, I take it quite seriously that the, the, the job is to push frontiers. And mm -hmm. it always sounds corny when you say things like that. But the point is you want to change the field. You want to discover things that are new insights that aren't little things that are just of interest to a few select people, but will help us kind of stand back and see the bigger picture. And it's a very lofty goal. And I'm not trying to pretend that, that I have done that. It's more that I've always seen that that is what we're supposed to be doing. Um, I, 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 yeah, look, I don't think that you should apologize at all for that. I mean, I think that's a great um, uh, ambition or aspiration to have. As you say, we don't always reach that, but to, to be wanting to, to head in that direction, I think that's very laudable. Yeah, to see that as the standard. And I, I, I do draw that from my experiments uh, experience in the US because mm. that's the standard that they were holding their students to. Um, it's the standard at UCSB. Um, I went to Elo Ecological Society of America annual meetings, which of course, you know, a zoo, thousands of people really good to, 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 to see uh, so many types of different things all being called ecology and being able to mingle with people who were uh, you know, changing the field. Yeah, you know, like um, I know maybe it's a bit premature, but um, coming back from the US and, and being in that, in that sort of rarefied atmosphere of, of wanting to, to uh, come to terms with with bigger things than just in your in, in your field did you did you see the same thing happening in Australia more yes, generally I, I did actually um, mm. Australia's problem is always that it's so small it, you mm. know mm. The population is small which means that you start to get down to a very small critical mass yes um, and you know the, the US benefits because it's a big country which means there are you know, thousands and thousands of ecologists not not a few hundred mm. Um, and that critical mass is really good because it provides that breadth uh, of people doing different things, but also you know, there's, there's enough of them saying my job is to change the field and that's what I want to do. Mm. And in Australia, people like Sam was definitely doing that. Mm. Um, so are other people. I think Tony Underwood would have to be considered hugely instrumental in basically setting some standards for the way ecologists were using statistics and testing testing hypotheses i know he, some quarters he was he was not well regarded because he had a habit of um really uh being quite nasty sometimes in, in seminars and skewering people he could be a difficult person i've experienced he, that he, he was indeed but he was incredibly genuine i um oh. i gave a presentation that he was present at which i found quite um intimidating this is when i first came back from the u.s um, and he asked a quite aggressive question and I said, but I mentioned that, you know, at this point in the talk, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and, but he came up and talked to me about the, the issue afterwards and he was really generous for this time. Mm. You know, I just asked him to explain something and he was very generous for this time. And, Everybody would say that. Yeah. And, and look, my, my experience with him was, was, was more the, the, you know, the, the conference type thing where he's asking very difficult questions and coming down quite hard on international guests, if I remember rightly, one one thing I went to. <laughs> but And I always, always thought that he and Sam just wouldn't get on because of their differences, but they actually got on quite well, didn't they? They got on very well, I think, because, um, you know, shared interest in in science. And, I mean, who could not like Sam? He's 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 just a likeable person. He, he, used, to, he used to call Tony Underwood underpants, I think. Yes, he? <laughs> <laughs> he did. I probably not, shouldn't. Not say the only one I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, no. I, I think that's what you know. We worked out that they did have that shared shared interest, and but they were quite different personalities. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, I actually met Tony uh, when I was at FSU because, of course, he would uh, visit there, being mu very much aligned with the kind of message coming out of FSU about good quality science and, mm -hmm. and here's how we should be doing it, and that articulated very well with Tony. So. Um, 
I met him actually while I was while I was doing my PhD. So it was quite interesting. Oh, well, there you go. So you're at Monash. You're doing these very sort of you're you're looking very intensely at these fairly small. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> things. Right. But 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 I mean, but you're learning a lot in the in the process. Yes, um, and uh, you know that work was published in general journals, so it was not just streaming work, and and that was you know thanks to Sam's influence as well being interested in big ideas not hmm. not just stream questions but questions that could be asked using streams um so I was the probably I was at Monash I think all up for about seven years uh after my postdoc finished um Sam became part of the cooperative research center for stream ecology um and I was um became a research fellow of that for a little mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. um and uh, all this time, of course, I was still wanting to get a permanent position. Yeah. So I was looking around, but I wanted to stay in Melbourne. Um, and so uh, one day in the age, I saw a, a, a job ad uh, for someone to work in the uh, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at the University of Melbourne. They were looking specifically for people who could do the environmental studies bit, which they had actually just taken on as a... Mm -hmm as a major. So I thought, well, a geography department, I don't know that they're going to be interested in me, but I put in an application and um, there were two positions and, and, and I got one of them. And mm. so uh, it was actually not a continuing position. It was a three year position, but it eventually did get it converted. So I ended up in a geography department <laughs> and this is something I could never have actually predicted. And the whole career trajectory at that point was, was things I'd never predicted. That there were opportunities came up. So an opportunity came up to go to the US, so I took it. An opportunity to do my postgrad work at FSU, so I took it. Um, an opportunity to go back to Australia and work with Sam. I mean, some of course is not just luck. You have to be kind of thinking yeah. about things yeah. and looking. Yeah. But a geography department, now that's not something I could have ever imagined, you know. Um, the last time I had done a subject called geography, I was 16 and I'd not done any geography. And uh, Michael Weber was, Professor Michael Weber was head of department. And I, I still remember when he rang to offer me the job because he said, we're going to take a chance on you. And uh, I knew exactly what he meant. What did he mean? What did he mean? Because I was not a geographer. Okay. And so what he meant was, that he, the department needed me to become somebody who could work with geographers mm -hmm. and do research that would articulate with the, the school's goals and things like that. But I knew exactly what he meant. And so I was not at all offended. I simply said back to him, I can see what you mean. And that was the end <laughs> of that conversation. But I never forgot this, that that was, it was okay for me to continue on with my ecological research on invertebrates, but I had to develop a research profile in environmental studies, broadly considered, because that's what I would be teaching. Mm -hmm. It's a bargain that I made, and I never forgot it. So um, when I joined the geography department, I very much continued working as a stream ecologist, but I started to develop a profile as someone who knew a bit about environmental impact assessment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book that eight of us published together, yes. um, monitoring, uh, I can't even remember the title of it, <laughs> uh, published in uh, uh, 2002. And um, that was a wonderful experience. And that sort of cemented the skills I had to actually teach this material as well to students. Was that your initiative, that book? Uh, it was sort of my initiative. Um, I had been talking with people like Mick Keogh and Jerry Quinn. Um, Mick had been working with Bruce Mapstone for quite a long time, and they developed this really nice, quite booklet based around those ideas. Many of them mm. then appeared in the in the book, and they had also thought that book would be really good. Um, so I decided I would have a go at getting a grant to support it, so that mm -hmm. we could actually bring people to Melbourne and have discussions and. Um, that in those days we still had Land and Water Australia, and I think they were called something else, unpronounceable acronym. Mm. And they bought it and gave us a, a little grant of about sixty-five thousand dollars to support the production of this book, largely to pay for plane tickets and hotels and 
uh, to enable us to have these workshops. Lurdic, uh, was it Lurdic back then? Lurdic, Landwater yeah. Research and Development Corporation. That's, that's the one. <clears throat> that's the one. Just testing my brain to see if it's yes. still there. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting thing because uh, so that it sort of you you made this pact to get in to 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 environmental science in this geography department and part of that was teaching this environmental impact stuff and from that it emerged an interest at least in in, in doing this book it's interesting to that i think that crossover between teaching and research and mm -hmm. and obviously you know um, producing books like that yeah. uh, something similar has happened to me as well and i think that f there's that real fertile interchange between teaching and research which i think some academics perhaps who don't necessarily commit themselves to teaching as much as maybe I think they should um, miss out on in some ways, perhaps. I don't know. But what what would you say about that that interchange between? Oh, I think um, I think teaching makes you a better researcher, and mm. the reason I think that is because if you are teaching not maybe not at first year, but if you're teaching third year students they're going to ask the kind of questions that you have to be able to provide a good response mm -hmm. and often they can kind of ask a question out of left field and make you think wow i don't know the answer to that so i i've always found that teaching is the best way of actually learning things myself it makes me read papers i probably wouldn't have otherwise read yes. and i have to be across things well enough to explain them simply so you no know, i taught statistics quite a lot of time i was there because nobody else had that expertise Teaching statistics is the best way to learn <laughs> how to use it. Yes. Um, and so I became a much better, I became much better at applying statistics in my own work because I had to really get across these ideas so well to be able to explain them to students. So I've always thought that teaching is makes me a better researcher. Mm. I, I get ideas out of teaching that I wouldn't have got if I was just purely research. The other element of two is that so much the life of the department revolves around teaching. Mm -hmm. If you're a research only person in, a, in a, an academic department, it can actually be quite a lonely existence because most of the discussion amongst the academics is when they're in teaching meetings or in staff meetings where they're probably talking about teaching. Much less is around research except for seminars. And so again, if you're not part of that, you also lose something. Mm, um, mm. I taught you know, about 14 lectures a year when I was at Monash, mostly in second year invertebrate zoology, but I also did some stats and some stream ecology stuff. And um, you know, I was getting those skills for my CV because I wanted to be able to get a job as an academic. But I still found it really good because it forced me to know things in a way I probably would otherwise not have take, got that level of knowledge. I think, uh, yeah, I think if I get one one message from from students who get taught by a casual and I'm not downplaying or yeah. denigrating casual teachers, but for people who've been around for a long time and, and teaching it, as you say, the second, maybe third year level, the depth that the students pick up on when you've got that depth, whether they can ask a left field question and you've got that experience to, at least to be able to attempt the answer rather than saying, I've got no idea, really. Yeah. Or, students, or students are very insightful <laughs> or making something up. Yeah, I learned a long time ago not to make, not make things up. No. Students pick up, pick up on that. And as you say, they also ask, they ask the questions to make you go, I can't really answer that question because nobody's really addressed that well enough in the research field. And maybe that's mm. something that should be followed up. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. I think it's um, that 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 interchange is, is very important. Um, so you're you're at Melbourne University and you're able to keep going with your yep. your stream ecology. Yeah. Did you have I, I, something that I, I'm interested in? with scientists generally is do you have i mean you you've obviously had a drive and you had you know you had a vision was there a real vision in terms of where the research was going you know did you have i mean you had you, you're talking about some of the things about um small patches and how organisms find those did you did you know where this work was ultimately going to go yeah so the 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 obsession with um, small patches, I kind of got that out of my system with my PhD. Mm. Um, when I worked with Sam, it was very much more thinking about a whole community of yep, organisms yep, sure. and stepping up to become much more of a community ecologist. Yep. And then a real interest in species diversity, as I said before, of trying mm. to figure out, well, how is it that you can get so many things living together? Um, 
So I was on that track to continue that kind of work. But then I had a sabbatical about 2000, year 2000, I think. So I joined um, Melbourne in 1995 is when I actually started there. And uh, I had a sabbatical, which I (laughs) went back to Monash because I didn't really want to go overseas and um, found time to read some stuff. And I read a paper by a guy called Peter Chesson. Now, I'd actually met Peter Chesson because he was also at University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, but again, very difficult to talk to. Um, Again, incredibly smart man. But uh, he would also be the sort of person who wouldn't make eye contact and wouldn't sort of initiate conversations. And so it was very, very difficult to meet and talk to him. So I didn't try. Um, But a world expert on theories that explain how species can live together in the same system using the same resources without some of them being driven to extinction by mm-hmm. competition. Mm-hmm. And um, that's looking at it from the perspective that not sort of saying everything is driven by competition, just that it's inevitable that there will be species who are better competitors for food or for living space or something else. And from a theoretical perspective, if you build models, there is no way other species can stay in that system. They're going to be driven to extinction. Mm-hmm. So um, so Peter had been working for a long time on theoretical models that could explain species diversity. And in 2000, he published this review of all the models, the coexistence models uh, that could explain this. And uh, basically sort of said, look, understanding coexistence is what we need to do if we want to understand diversity. Mm, mm, I thought that makes a lot of sense, mm. but I was looking at his models and they required highly detailed information about how much mortality there is at different stages uh, and what organisms eat so that you know what their uh, resource uses are. So I know, are they potential competitors because they're eating the same food? And I kind of suddenly had a penny drop moment where I realized there was no way I was going to get anywhere near testing any of those models because we just didn't know the answers to basic questions Mm -hmm. about these populations. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know what organisms eat, right? There's been a few studies, but we don't have detailed information on that. And the other thing, uh, the epiphany that came to me was this recognition that we're all working on the juvenile stage. And so stream ecology, if you were a bug person, was all about the stage that lives in the water. Mm. Nobody, largely, was working on the adult stage, which lives in the terrestrial environment. Nobody had worked on eggs. Mm -hmm. So how do females find streams? Where do they put their eggs? Are they successful? Do those eggs hatch? No information at all. Don't know anything about first instars because they, you know, use nets with the mesh sizes big enough that they fortunately go away and we never see them. So... I sort of realized I'm wasting my time. I'm not doing any more community stuff, looking at doing experiments and counting up the number of species. This is a waste of time. Peter's paper had basically shown me that won't get me anywhere. Mm. And so pretty much, I like to say overnight, but of course it probably was a, <laughs> more than that, started to think I need to be not working on larvae. I need to work on something else. And in one of those wonderful coincidences, uh, Paul Reich, came to do a PhD with me and was really interested in also not just working on larvae. He actually wanted to work on adults and look at the relationship between adults and vegetation. He couldn't make that project work. And so at this point, we had tripped over these kind of jelly-like masses on the bottom of rocks. And I had suggested to Paul, look, nobody's worked on this. This is a completely open field. How about you do your PhD, sort out who belongs to these egg masses, where do they put them, you know, how do they make decisions about where they go? And um, he did this lovely project in which there was just all these lovely patterns just waiting to be found in which he discovered that you know, females have actually got preferences for where they put their eggs in terms of they want to use an emergent rock. They mm-hmm. use that as a landing point. And then they go down the the you know the uh, downstream surface, mm-hmm. 
And if the current is the right speed, they'll lay their eggs mass as a, as a single mass. And if it's not, then they will exit and find another rock. Um, so that turned us on to eggs. And so basically uh, stopped working on larvae and really started working on, on egg masses. About this time I met Jill and mm -hmm. Jill was very taken with egg masses as well. She's a very curious person. She also is really, really fascinated. And so we started to do a lot of work together trying to sort out these sorts of questions. We did work in Scotland together and we did work in Australia together as well. So um, over the last 20 years, I think my research has been about trying to fill in these gaps of knowledge. And I just have a little diagram that I'd just like yeah. to share here. Yeah, sure. Um, and this sort of diagram we're looking at here, yep. I, I actually used this in a, in a grant proposal to try to explain uh, how our research was um, basically addressing a collection of questions. And what we're looking at here, of course, is a sort of schematic of a generic life cycle. So we mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. the juvenile larvae in the stream. This is for insects, of course, so we'll yep. think about them. Some of them form a pupae, some of them just come out of the mm -hmm. stream. There's a terrestrial adult stage, usually winged, can fly anywhere, who knows where. Females at some point have to come back to a stream and lay their eggs back into the stream. So as I said before, this is where an awful lot of work was being done. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was a contributor to that. Um, but we started to work on these stages here. And uh, basically I had PhD students that were asking various questions about the success of females, where do they put their eggs? And what's the implications of all that? Mm -hmm. um, and a grant uh, here where we're actually focusing on neonates. And in this one, uh, this grant is with Peter Chesson. Mm -hmm. And that's a quite interesting thing is that I hadn't actually met or talked with Peter since I'd known him in California days, but I was acting as an editor for a journal. And I wrote to him and asked him if he would, could be a referee on a paper. And we got to sort of chatting a little bit and uh, I described my interest in trying to test some of his ideas. And I, in the end, screwed up my courage and asked him if he would like to collaborate on, a, on an ASC project. And he agreed to do that. And that's one of the current projects we have here where we're really looking at the individuals that hatch out of those eggs. What happens mm. in those first few minutes to hours to days of life before they become a second instar, you know, a lot of the action happens there. And when you're looking at mature larvae, all of that's finished, it's done. So you're, you're not actually seeing any of that kind of mortality or movement. Um, and the grant we have at the moment is, is on adults looking at dispersal and mortality. And so this is how all this stuff has linked together over the years to try and build up a picture that asks questions about where in this life cycle are the critical events that determine success of a species or not. Mm -hmm. So points where there's lots of mortality, points where there's lots of dispersal, these are points where a population either grows or shrinks. Of course, reproduction is a really key thing. And so births is a really important part of this. So that's how all this stuff over the last 20 years has, has linked together. Yeah. That, that that makes a lot of sense. Can I ask you? This is going to be a re, probably a really dumb question, but um, insects tend. I mean, I know there are a lot of crustaceans in freshwater. Insects probably dominate the diversity, at least in freshwater. Yeah. But in marine systems, it's crustaceans. Yeah. Can you tell me, as a I should know this, but I don't. Why? Why there? Why there is this stark contrast between the two? Do you know yeah, that? It's, answer it's that? a good question. Um, I I think the answer is something to do with the physiology. Um, this is kind of ringing bells because I think I was asked that question as part of my oral exam <laughs> when I was doing a PhD, and I know well, I, I actually gave a really great answer, but I don't remember what. <laughs> um, but there's some basic stuff uh, I think that insects don't do very well. Um, as part of the reason why there are very, very few marine insects and the ones yeah. that are, are, are largely living, you know, in the intertidal zone and not really in the water or they're on top of the water. So water so, striders, for example, that live yeah. out in the open ocean. 
Yeah, so Osma regulation, maybe Osma regulation. Something like that, stuff. don't quote me. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, it's, it's something I, I need agree. to. It's a really interesting question, isn't it? It is. It is a really interesting question. And, and I don't think our students ever ask me that, but I've often thought um, about it and should find an answer, a good answer. So when somebody does ask me that question, um, I, you know, yeah, look, we're getting, we're, we're, been talking for quite a long time um, but you've got a really nice I, I really like that the fact that you can encapsulate um, a lot of the ideas and and sort of thinking in, in that in that one diagram and, and, and obviously in the descriptions you've been giving us so you, you've got this current um, ARC grant and um, with, with Chesson um, so that's going to keep you occupied for the next couple of years yeah so the, the one with Peter Chesson is sort of done um, mm, okay. but we're still writing all the papers up from it. The current uh, grant right. uh, is again with Jill yep. and uh, with a woman called Deb Finn, who's at Missouri State University. And she's an ecologist, but she uses genetics to, to answer questions. So she's going to have a genetic angle on, on our project, which is about how adults move around in landscapes. Um, and uh, so we've just collected a whole bunch of data uh, right up on the catchment boundaries between two streams. Yeah. Uh, we've had light traps up there as well as down on the main stems. And we have caught, you know, we have a 120 species. We've caught 48,000 individuals across 10 streams. So 120 species, that's just the caddis. I mean, wow. I'm talking wow. about the mayflies or the wow. stoneflies or the beetles. Half of them we catch right up at the top of the catchment boundary. There's no water up there. The rivers, if you want to call them that, are just kind of dry depressions, gullies. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple. There's hundreds of them up there. What They're are they doing up there? Around. They are dispersing between streams, we think. So they're going up river valleys. I don't know how they do it because they don't have water to guide them anymore. Mm -hmm. They're going up river valleys and potentially they are going along ridge tops and then dropping down into another valley and colonizing streams uh, on the other side. Um, that's what we think. We don't have quite the evidence for that yet, but we do have evidence that they're up there. Males right. and females, yeah, and about 60 species of caddis out of the 120 um, we've caught well away from streams, which is really quite interesting. And again, I don't think anybody has ever done that before. Mm, nice. I, one of the things, <laughs> um, you know, I find about, about, well, about science, but about biology and ecology in particular for me, is that there's just never, there's no end to questions. I mean, we, we can we just can keep going forever, which means that the the, the curiosity um, gets sated for a little while, and then you've got a, another thing to look at. Do you see yourself going on with this sort of stuff for a long time yet, or what? Oh, look, I, I think so. I'm not sure I'd have the energy to write another ARC grant because they are so much work to put together and put in. Um, I think I might be done with my grant <laughs> writing days and it, it also comes of course with responsibilities and sure. you know if you sort of think I'd just like to go away for six months and do something else you kind of can't because you have grant you have responsibilities you know you've been given a big pile of money mm. public money and you have to deliver the research that you promised to do but in terms of the interest and the ideas I reckon we'll be going on for many more years yet yeah. And we could potentially do just little projects without having grants, I think, and still write up things that are novel and interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we'll be going for a while yet. And you, um, going back to the beginning, you said you were fascinated with birds that got you going in the first mm. place. Are you, are you a twitcher? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't call myself a twitcher because twitchers, some of them are just, um, they're like stamp collectors. You know, they, they, they collect species and... So they'll, they'll drive 2,000 miles to see some, you know, nondescript wader that's sort of drifted and gone off course and is in Australia for the first time, and they will drive thousands of kilometres so they can tick off seeing mm. that species. That's not what I'm about. I mean, I'm very happy to see common birds, rarer birds. Um, I do a lot of bird watching still. Um, and have you ever done research on birds? No. Is no, that they're very hard to work on, so no. <laughs> Oh, I just wonder whether that's one of those situations where you you don't want to, you'd rather keep it as a like a hobby and interest rather than becoming no, a profession. No, originally, when I decided what I wanted to do when I was about age 12, um, I learned the word ornithologist. And I could still remember 
a class um, in primary school where you know the teacher was talking about what everybody wanted to do, and I said I wanted to be an ornithologist, and you know got ostracised almost immediately by everybody else <laughs> in that room for being a snob or something using a big word. I hadn't meant it that way, but I'd learned the right word for it. I I thought I would work on birds. But when I started to learn the meaning of research, I realized that birds are really quite constraining about the kinds of questions you ask. They're quite difficult to work with, you know, to catch them and to make observations. And I quickly actually decided, no, not birds. And then I thought marine systems and we already know how that went, so. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think you've, um, I think you chose, ended up in, a, in an area which is a wonderful area. I'm, I'm a great fan of, of, of freshwater and especially stream macro invertebrates because mm. of this, the sort of things you're talking about. In my teaching, we um, we we do we use a server sampler for my third year class, and we go out and um, and take samples of 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 cobble, mostly cobble dwelling macro invertebrates. And the students are absolutely gobsmacked every time because they look down there, they can't see anything, and we come back with. Um, well, in our case, dozens and dozens of species, most of them either caddisflies or mayflies. And they're, apart from anything else, they're beautiful animals to, to look at, aren't they? Yeah. Um, you know, I, because I was in a geography department, I wasn't teaching students who had done zoology or biology, uh, botany largely. They were doing geography, which is mm. distinctly different. But you could always interest them in bugs. Like, you know, if they yes. did my subject and you'd go down to, you know, a creek and sample stuff, they're always fascinated by it. It's really yes. interesting. Yes, no, endlessly fascinating. And um, no, I, I, I agree with you 100%. Well, thanks very much, Barb. I think we better stop there. We've been talking okay. for a long time. And um, I really appreciate you giving your time to, to no talk worries. and talk about your your life, your career. And um, I especially really like that, that idea that ecologists should be looking at uh, for patterns and processes that, at that um, a bigger scale than just the one or bigger picture than the one that they might yeah, be doing. The is. scale doesn't have to be bigger. Just no. Your horizons have to be big. I like that. We'll leave it at there. Thanks very much. All right. See ya. See ya. All right. I've